As I've mentioned before, my first console was a Sega Master System. Well, technically it was a Sega Master System 2, but that distinction was lost on me at the time, and to be honest, it basically still is. I've never seen a Master System 1 in real life, for all I know they may just be a global conspiracy designed to confuse doddering old men. I wouldn't put anything past the Illuminati. Fight the powers that be, kids. The truth is out there. Um, anyway, the Master System 2. I know it never really managed to compete with the NES in many parts of the world, but here in Australia and in Europe it definitely did. Now, I'm not going to claim it had a better library of games than the NES, it's tough to compete with Mario, Zelda and Metroid, but it certainly had quite a few real gems. Most of my favourite games from the time were platformers like Castle of Illusion, The Lucky Dime Caper and Asterix, and there were decent versions of Sonic 1 and 2. There were also quite a few high quality shooters like Fantasy Zone, R-Type and the Power Strike series. And, in PAL territories at least, there were a large number of Mega Drive ports. Yes, they were definite downgrades in many ways, but for people who couldn't quite afford to make the step up to 16-bit, they were a godsend. But there was one game that stood above all others in my memory, Wonder Boy 3 The Dragon's Trap. I'd played the first Wonder Boy and enjoyed it a great deal, but it was a relatively simple game. Wonder Boy 3, on the other hand, was probably the most complex and sophisticated platformer I'd played up to that point, and so much of the game remained emblazoned on my memory. And I'm not alone in that respect, it remains one of the best loved Master System games, and a couple of years ago it got a remake of sorts. I say of sorts because it's really just a graphical update with no changes or adaptations made to the game itself. Or are there? Stay tuned to find out. Maybe. No guarantees. Anyway, I recently got my hands on this updated version, so let's give it a go and see just how accurate my memories are. That said, first up we've got some choices that weren't in the original. You can choose a difficulty setting, and for now I'll go with normal. I remember finding the game pretty challenging as a youngster, so I guess we'll see if the game is actually tough or if I was just an idiot back then. Well, the latter is a given, so we'll actually see if I'm as big an idiot now. That too is a given, I'm afraid. We also get to choose the sex of our hero this time around. I'm going to go with the girl, partially for the sake of variety, but mainly because I'm a sucker for redheads. And anyway, it doesn't really matter that much, as you don't retain your human form for long. The game starts with what is basically a playable recap of the end of the prequel, Wonder Boy in Monster Land. I'm ashamed to admit I've never actually played Monster Land, but I don't think I'm missing out on too much story-wise. You begin in that game's final dungeon, and... Okay, the first thing to talk about is the way you can switch between modern and retro graphics and sound with the press of a single button. Well, two buttons, one for graphics and one for sound. This is great for two reasons. First, it's a real kick in the nostalgia gland in the best possible way. Secondly, it's a chance to appreciate the work and artistry that's gone into the updated graphics. The artwork is just fantastic, with a hand-drawn style, characterful animations, and a beautiful colour palette. I'm tempted to play the whole thing in retro mode, just for the nostalgia factor, but ultimately I just can't go past the new storybook aesthetic. But no doubt I'll find myself switching back and forth from time to time. In this opening section, Wonder Boy, or Girl, as the case may be, is at her full power, and she can dispatch her foes with ease. That's not going to last, of course. In true Metroidvania fashion, once you defeat Mecha Dragon, the last boss from the previous game, you succumb to the eponymous dragon's trap and find yourself transformed into Lizard Man. You lose all your hearts except one, not to mention your weapon and armour. But you gain the most determined, adorable little frown in the world. I just love the artwork and animation on this little guy. I love the way he curls his tail around himself when he ducks, and I love the way he's a truly accurate evolution of his 8-bit self. Hmm, I just noticed I'm referring to this character as a he now. Doesn't really matter, I guess. Wonder Girl is a lizard creature now. Gender constructs are probably the least of her worries. You make your way out of the crumbling castle, up to the courtyard, and past this mysterious locked door. I've spoken of my love of non-linearity in games, particularly in times long past when most games were very straightforward indeed. Wonder Boy 3 was the first platformer I played that wasn't just a mostly left-to-right affair, and, quite apart from the fact that you're moving right to left at this point, this locked door held an allure that I found truly magical. What lies beyond? 
At this moment I can't actually remember, but I do remember finding the mystery of it extremely exciting when I was a kid. Before long you escape the castle and get to see the title screen in all its 8-bit glory. Or its 64-bit glory, as I guess it would technically be, unless we're talking about colour palettes. I don't actually know what I'm talking about, and in any case, no one cares about bits anymore. And then you're at the main sort of hub level, the place to which you'll be returning often, and which opens up more and more paths as you gain items and abilities. This is another element of this sort of non-linear game that I loved. It made the game world seem so alive and full of promise. What's the deal with these checkered blocks? How do I get to that door over there? Where can I find a key for this lock? So many questions, so few answers. Well, in truth, I remember the answer to the first two of those questions very well, and as for finding the key, there's only one path open to you at this point. Well, once you've gone and got the extra heart, thus doubling your hit points, and upgraded your weapon and armor as much as your extremely limited budget will allow. But then it's on to the beach. This segment is a pretty straightforward left-to-right affair, but there are also underwater sections. There's not much you can do there at the moment, but if only you could swim, maybe you could uncover something more. Get to the end and there's the key you need. There's also a shop selling armor and a shield. The latter is way too expensive to even consider at the moment, but I at least take the time to farm some extra gold for the armor, which will make things a little easier going forward. It's pretty simple stuff by today's standards, and is even looked upon negatively, but back then killing enemies over and over for money was a valid way of extending gameplay. In truth, this game doesn't really require much of it at all, certainly not enough to become a real annoyance. And back in the day I found it a pleasantly satisfying way to pass the time. I probably would have even had the patience to just grind away until I had enough for the shield as well. Not today though. Now I've got the key I needed, it's time to see what's beyond that locked door back in the village. While I'm here though, I'm sure I remember there being a secret door somewhere that you could access by standing in the right place and pressing up. I can't seem to find it though, maybe I was mistaken. So then, on to the desert, which for some reason is through this door in the sky. And now you have a choice, left or right. I'm pretty damn sure that I remember left as being the way you want to go, but I have no memory of what's to the right, so I'll give that a go first. The fact that these frogs take quite a few hits to kill and wipe away nearly half my health with one hit suggests that the game doesn't want me to go this way quite yet. So I oblige and head to the left. Yes, this all looks very familiar. Cacti, Egyptian iconography, sunflowers spitting fireballs. I have clear memories of what the first proper boss is, and this all fits in well with my expectations. One other thing I remember well is that if you go over the pyramid you find this chamber with a very handy heart upgrade. Just as importantly, I remember that if you keep entering and exiting this room you get to kill this pig guy over and over, and he tends to drop large amounts of cash for this stage of the game. You can also drop magic items, which I haven't actually talked about yet, mainly because they're not particularly useful in my experience. The boomerang is pretty cool, it can be reused over and over if you catch it, and it can collect items that are out of range. And the arrow has its uses if you need to kill something above you, like the particularly annoying clouds that drop fireballs. Other than that though, I never really use magic. Anyway, traversing the pyramid itself isn't too tough. The game is still taking it pretty easy on you, even though you've only got three hearts, nothing is doing too much damage, especially since I took the time to buy that armor earlier. Before too long, the boss shows up and... Okay, in many ways this game holds up really well in terms of gameplay, with the graphics set to the modern version you could believe this was a game that was developed quite recently. But one element that hasn't held up is the boss fights. These days we expect bosses to really be something special, tough challenges with multiple moves and maybe even multiple phases. But back in those days, that was a bit too much to ask. All the bosses are simple, and really not all that interesting. They're actually not as bad as those in James Pond 2, which I criticised a few weeks back for the same reason, but they're not great. At least the updated graphics make them visually appealing. Although, to be fair, even the 8-bit versions had plenty of character. Once the mummy dragon is dead, Lizard Man's time in the sun is over and it's Mouse Man's turn to shine. And here, I think, is the best example of an improvement in the updated graphics. The 8-bit version of Mouse Man always troubled me. He looks like a squashed version of Mickey Mouse. The modern version looks a lot better, I'd say. 
Modern or retro, Mouse Man comes with the ability to stick to checkered blocks, allowing him to walk up walls or on the ceiling. And so a new move has been added to our repertoire. What new secrets and hidden paths may we find with this? Well, first off, we can now access this shop, which has items that I absolutely cannot afford. And you know what? Until I watched this footage back, I completely forgot about this shop, so I don't think I ever bothered to return with more cash. Oh well, my loss. Anyway, we can also now get over that big wall of checkered blocks to the left of the village, and access the door, which leads to... more items I can't afford. Well, not quite. That's okay, I don't really need them yet, enemies still aren't doing too much damage. Plus, as you go through this jungle environment, you find shops where you can buy more cost-effective items, and one where you can buy potions. These are incredibly helpful, as they restore most of your health when you die. You can carry three of them at a time, effectively quadrupling your health pool, which, as the game gets tougher and my skills get more inadequate, is going to prove to be vital. They very rarely drop from enemies, but this is the only shop that sells them, which is a pain, given that it's way out here in the boondocks. Once you get into the tower, you discover an environment that makes comprehensive use of Mouse Man's wall climbing ability. And this is something else that every good Metroidvania style game does. Presents you with challenges that require cunning use of your newfound abilities. In truth, there's nothing particularly cunning required in this game. As Metroidvanias go, this isn't quite as sophisticated as the games that went towards creating the name of the genre, but it's still pretty damn good and absolutely blew my mind when I first played it. The boss of this place is Zombie Dragon, and he too is very easily dispatched. At least now he has a nice pool of green slime to sink into, rather than the bare floor of the 8-bit version. And now we get to be Piranha Man. You might have noticed my not-so-subtle hints before about needing the ability to swim. Now I have that, so the next step is to go back to the beach area and see what new areas are open to me. Except... Hmm, there's a room with a handy treasure chest, but not much else. My way is still barred by these other blocks, which, from memory, you can't destroy until you kill the next boss and get the next form. So, now I genuinely can't remember where to go. There aren't exactly that many options though, so before long I realise that I'm probably supposed to go to that area I went before, where the blue frogs kicked my ass. And yep, this seems a bit more doable now that I'm a sword-wielding fish dude. There's a definite lava theme happening here, and I managed to fall into it many, many times. Fortunately, Piranha Man seems surprisingly resilient to Thousand Degree Molten Rock, so I survive long enough to reach a shop that offers lava-resistant armor. It soon becomes clear that this purchase is not optional, because beyond this point you don't have much choice about hopping into the scorching pools. Before long, you get to a building with a room that contains the answer to something I'd been trying to recall for ages. I couldn't quite remember if you ever got the chance to go back to the forms you'd already taken. I suspected you probably could at some point, but I'd definitely forgotten how it was done. Well, step on this platform and you can cycle through all the forms you'd taken previously. Apart from your original form, of course, that would be a bit of an anticlimax given that's the entire goal of the game. There are checkered blocks here in abundance, so it doesn't take a rocket surgeon, or a brain scientist, to figure out that you want to be Mouse Man. Climb up and you find... A ring that lets you smash certain blocks. Turns out I was wrong, you don't need to kill the next boss before you can do that. Okay, so it's back to town, and now, with the combination of Mouse Man's wall grabbing and the ability to smash blocks, I can get to a new subterranean area. I seem to be taking quite a pounding though, these blue snakes are knocking off almost an entire heart with each hit. I'm just about to turn around and try a different route when suddenly... Right, so what the hell is this place? I'm 99% sure I didn't find this when I played the game as a kid. It is possible that this is a new area created specifically for the remake. I mean, that's feasible, but it's also feasible that I just completely missed it when I played the game in the early 90s. In any case, it seems rather tough, so I make a mental note to come back later and head back to town. I remember this building has smashable blocks in it, so maybe I need to do something here? Apparently so. Now I can change forms whenever I want. And now that I can both swim and smash blocks, I know where I need to be. Now I can reach the submerged pirate ship that is home to the next boss. I progress through here without too many issues. 
Well, at least I do once I make a side trip back to the shop that sells potions. And then it's boss time. And here's a good example of how perceptions change. Now, this boss, like the others, seems basic as hell and a little boring. Back when I first played this game, however, I was in awe of him. He jumped and shot projectiles that bounced? What a worthy foe. I specifically remember that I even drew a picture of the boss, complete with his bouncing hook attack, and drew an arrow pointing at the safe spot underneath the arc of projectiles. I then gave this picture to my best friend, who was struggling with this particular boss. I was a patronizing little shit. Anyway, even without the aid of my incredible strategy guide to remind me of where to stand, I managed to kill him without too many issues. And now I'm Lion Man. I like this form. He swings his sword in a wide arc that makes killing enemies a damn sight easier. It also allows you to destroy blocks above and below him, thus opening up a few new areas. However, it turns out the way I need to go is the way I tried before as Mouse Man, only to get my ass kicked. Well, now I'm a brawny lion with better armor, it shouldn't be too tough. But it kind of is. The tunnel section isn't too bad, but once you get to this Japanese style palace, the difficulty kicks up a notch. Turns out ninjas and samurai make a formidable team. I'd probably fare better if I could be bothered farming up some more cash to go and replenish my potion supply, but it seems I'd rather spend 30 minutes dying repeatedly than 20 minutes doing something actually productive. In the end though, it turns out luck is better than either diligence or intelligence. I remember there are plenty of secret rooms in the game, though I can't really remember where any of them are. Well, right here at the door to the boss, with only a sliver of health left, I happen to find one. And what's inside? A full health recovery and a potion. That ought to do it. I swear I had no memory it was there, but I'm damn glad to find it. With this stroke of luck, the boss presents no problems. The Hawkman Cometh. I remember thinking this final form was a bit of a letdown, especially after the Lion Man's brute force. Yes, he can fly, but he deals less damage and is more fragile than his predecessor. Also, although the ability to fly obviously opens up new options, including the ability to go back to the door that so intrigued me right at the start of the game, it actually makes the game slightly more irritating. You can't block and flap your wings at the same time, and the final dungeon exploits that weakness mercilessly. Before that though, I finally find the hidden door in the village that I half remembered. I'd forgotten you needed to fly to get to it, but on the whole I'm gratified my memory at least partially works. Next I take a trip back to the aforementioned door, which simply allows you to revisit the opening area of the game. The dungeon you went through as Wonderboy, or uh, girl, I'd almost forgotten about that. It's a detour worth taking, as it's here you can find the legendary sword and armor, which to my knowledge are the best options in the game. I assume there's also a legendary shield somewhere too, but I can't actually find it. I could spend some time trying to track it down, and I'm sure there are at least a couple of hard upgrades I've missed, but I feel like I've got enough going for me to take down the final boss. Turns out I managed to underestimate my ineptitude again. The final dungeon itself isn't too much of a hassle, well, with a couple of exceptions. You're required to revisit all your other forms, oh, except for Wizard Man, sadly. And these sections are fine, but it's when you're forced to be Hawkman that I have the most problems. Fireballs in particular seem to do disproportionately high damage to him, and the final room before the boss's lair is particularly irritating. And the final boss itself is even worse. It shoots fireballs at awkward heights, making them rather tough to block or avoid. It's not exactly the greatest gaming challenge I've ever faced, but I die more than once. And more than twice. And more than... You know what, let's just say I die enough to make me rethink my strategy. Turns out, although I can't find the legendary shield, there is one other shield I can buy, but it's going to require some more gold farming. Which I do. It seems each form has a shield specifically intended for it, and possibly those shields are extra powerful when used by the right form, because this new shield has a drastic effect in reducing the damage Hawkman takes from fireballs. This includes the fireballs the final boss shoots, and suddenly the whole fight seems a damn sight more manageable. I only need a single potion to finish him off this time. And that's the game done. Well, essentially. You collect this crucifix, I guess. Who knew it would be the power of Jesus that saved the day? 
and then all your non-human forms are cast out. I actually feel kind of sorry for them, it's like they're separate entities that briefly found a place in the universe but now have to be banished to the void or something. The credits roll, including childhood photos of the developers, which I find kind of adorable. Then you're dumped back into the game as Wonder Girl, giving you the chance to track down whatever items and secrets you might have missed, not to mention do those unknown sections. Turns out there's one of them for every form, although I've only found a few of them. And one day I may go back and do all that stuff, but honestly for now I'm perfectly satisfied with the game. It was truly a delight to go back and revisit such a memorable part of my childhood. In terms of sophistication and complexity, it's not as remarkable as it once was, sure, but it's still a very well-designed game by any standards. It's enjoyable to explore without being too tough to navigate, and even today I think it would be a great introduction to the whole Metroidvania thing for younger gamers, or for those of us so ancient that all semblance of skill has left us. And it still plays remarkably well. Wonder Boy slash Girl and the various forms control smoothly and responsively, easily the match of most modern platformers, with Hawkman's flight being the only slightly awkward element. Again, it's not massively complicated, you run, jump, swing your sword and use the occasional magic spell if you ever remember you have them, but it all comes together to form a fun, interesting and just downright pleasant game. As for the graphics, well, opinions will vary of course, but I think most people would agree the updated artwork is pretty great. Personally, I love it, I don't think there's a background or a frame of animation that doesn't work well. The music is also damn good. The new orchestration is really high quality and adds significantly to the appeal of the game. That said, while the tunes in the original game were mostly good and occasionally great, they didn't quite gain the status of classics, at least not to my mind. Now, even though I've massively enjoyed playing through the game again, the question has to be asked, is it good value for money? It currently sells for 30 Australian dollars on Steam, about 20 bucks US. Which is not insignificant for a game so old and so relatively simple. You could get a dozen games from the Mega Drive collection on Steam for that. But of course, there's the new artwork and music, and it's undeniable that a whole heap of work has gone into them. Does that make it worth the money? Well, that depends on your priorities and on your budget, so I can't answer that unequivocally. I personally bought the game when it was on sale, and I don't regret it one bit. Okay, thanks for watching. Please yada yada like, yada yada subscribe, yada 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 means a lot. Next time, I'll be looking at another attempt to recapture the glory of old school platforming, but one that took a different route and fell much, much shorter. Until then, get off my lawn.